As creatives and business owners, negotiating can be a daunting task, especially when we're starting out. We often feel grateful just to have a job and end up lowering our fees. However, for women in architecture and business, the challenge is even greater. So what happens when you're presented with the opportunity of a lifetime? What do you do when you find yourself in a room with your dream client? How do you level the playing field without formal business training? In this episode, I will share my personal experiences and strategies that I use to navigate these situations as a woman in business and in architecture. I gave this talk at the Women Architects Festival produced by Joanne Louis, the founder of the Women Architects Collective. Tune in to learn how I negotiate like a pro and level the playing field. You're listening to the Architect My Life podcast, a show dedicated to empowering women architects and designers to achieve business growth, financial freedom, and health and wellness. I'm Aya Schlachter, your host and CEO of MGS Global Group. Our company provides Revit, Archicad, and CAD drafting services to busy architects and design firm owners. MGS Global started as a part-time gig when I was a new mom, but it has now grown into a thriving business that provides drafting support to creatives, helping everyone maintain a healthy work-life balance. This podcast is proudly presented by MGS Global Group. Now let's dive into this episode. Hi, everyone, and thanks for being here today. And I'm really excited to share my experiences and how to level the playing field as a woman in architecture. But before I start, I just wanted to know, like, there are a lot of reasons why people want to level up, right? We have, we all have personal reasons, whether it is to get bigger clients or get better projects, or you want to learn how to set more boundaries with your boss or prove that you can be successful as an architect or entrepreneur, or just prove to your husband or your family that you can do it if there are doubters in your life. But also, you know, when I was watching Joanne's talk earlier, the Women Architecture Festival really is something that I really support and believe in because I want to help women build their confidence to pave the way, give back, and with opportunities for people and share all my experiences. I realize that my content is based on firm owners, but I share a lot of stories from my early career. But again, you can take a lot of these lessons for firm owners, how to build themselves up and also take lessons for your personal journey wherever you are in your career. And lastly, keep an open mind. It's going to be a great session. But for some of you who don't know me, people always ask what I do. So I always say this, I'm a mom, wife, I'm a creative at heart. Like all of us, we like to paint and create and do a lot of creative things. I'm an athlete by passion, but I'm an entrepreneur by DNA. So I want to show you a little bit of a timeline. I was born and raised in the Philippines, and I moved to the U.S. when I was 19. I'm a middle child, a little bit shy, and I moved to the U.S. I was culture shocked. I didn't have friends. My parents were back home. And one of the reasons why I came here was to come out of my shell. I used to be very shy. I didn't talk much. So similar to Joanne, she's from Hong Kong. I'm from Philippines, and we both went to NJIT. So I went to school there. And then right after NJIT, I didn't want to go home to the Philippines. And I couldn't get a job because I didn't have experience. So I went to grad school immediately and I got into Columbia, which, you know, I was a very average student in the academics wise, but I really enjoyed urban design and like studios. So I got in, I was the youngest in our batch. And then that gave me a lot of anxiety because most of my classmates in Columbia already had five years of experience and I was the youngest. And again, everyone there were all eight type personalities and me who barely spoke a word. But after that, I got a job two weeks later after grad school in Greenwich, Connecticut. I was living in New York in Queens and did the reverse commute. And that was really hard on me because you had to wake up at 4 a.m. to get to work and come back. But one thing about being a foreign architect, I don't know if you're, there are foreigners here who just moved to the U.S. You can't really just leave a job and come and pick another job. I realized that was a mistake that I joined that firm in Connecticut because the turnover rate was crazy. Like every month somebody was quitting, but I got stuck there for three years. So I guess that's where I built my resilience and tolerance for pain. I burnt out and all my friends left. Like we worked for, I remember 24 hours straight or even two days straight. I didn't go home to Queens. I mean, that's what we can all relate, right? There's a lot of burnout in our profession. So at age 27, I got married. I finally was able to quit 
and then got a second job in Manhattan this time. And then I got married and then I decided to start my ARE because I wanted to have my own firm and become a boss. And that was my goal in life was to start my own firm. In my 30s, I quit my job finally, had a baby, decided I wanted to focus on the ARES and study and take care of my baby. But then I realized, oops, I needed a little bit of income. So I started looking for jobs. I couldn't find, a, not jobs, but side gigs. With a baby at hand, I didn't know what type of side gigs I would get. And my first client was doing shop drawings for an awnings contractor in Queens. And I was so happy. But that was one of the happiest times in my life when I had just my baby and me and drafting. But later, I had an opportunity to work with a big retailer. And they gave me work for to do some kind of interior drafting or design for small stores. So they gave me one and then they said, can you handle more? And I said, yes, I can. I'm an entrepreneur. I grew up with an entrepreneurial family. So I started this, this firm from my apartment when I was breastfeeding my daughter, Anna. I had three or four drafters, all friends from my colleagues, my coworkers who were helping me. And we were able to do like 300 stores in six months. They're small stores in the department stores. So I was able to provide income for my friends. That's how like my drafting professional started. At 32, but with a baby, we wanted to go, go back to the Philippines because it was too hard for me to raise a kid in New York. So this time I'm like, okay, I have a retail client. I can build a drafting team in the Philippines. We're going to be fine. Moved to the Philippines. Had a recession, found myself living in my parents' basement for two years. No job, no opportunities. Like I felt so bad about myself because we didn't have anything really. And two years went by, we had the second baby. So I started like three other side gigs that failed. One was a jewelry designer that didn't work out. The other one was doing graphic design for a wedding company in Korea to do wedding albums that failed. And then the last one, I was opening a nail kiosk in the malls. And I'm like, what am I doing working on Korean wedding albums and like opening up a nail kiosk? Like, this is so wrong. And I'm 32 or 34. So I decided, oh, okay, you know what? People love food. So I decided, okay, I'll go make a chocolate cafe because Philippines has native chocolate. So I started, I was again breastfeeding my second son and then making chocolate. And I designed this cool cafe. I went to the malls. None of them wanted me because they don't know who I am. And they only want to get the Starbucks and all those fancy coffee shops. But one mall gave me an opportunity to start my cafe. And I'm like, yay, finally I could seed. So that was one of the cafes that we did. I designed everything. I cooked and did everything. That's my family. I also started doing draft one when I was in the Philippines. But years later, the same time I started that cafe, my drafting business started to pick up and more retailers started to work with me. So now I'm running a cafe business. And then I'm running my drafting business. I have 10 drafting people. So I pretty much burned out, but we grew it to like four cafes in, in three years that I was there in the Philippines. So I was like, okay, should I be an architect still or run a cafe? Because people wanted to franchise my cafe. So again, I'm like, oh, and then I felt like I was at the top of the world because I had my cafes and then I had the drafting business. It was so great. When I was 39, my husband and I made a deal that if he didn't like it in the Philippines, we'll move back to Cleveland. So I'm like, it was very hard for me to leave my family and my staff and the businesses, but we had an agreement to move back. So I did, and I picked my family over the business. So I'm back to square one in Cleveland, alone, confused. I started again with the ARE and I'm still not an architect. I failed a few and I'm like, okay, this is depressing, but I just kept on going. And the business, the MGS Global Group, we're a drafting firm. It just kept on growing and growing. And later on, being in Cleveland was the best decision I made in my life because now I have access to all my clients and my kids are happy and my husband is happy. I have my family. That cafe is being run, being run by my brother and my mom and I'm completely detached. But there's a reason why I mentioned the cafe business. So now I'm 47. I started the Architect My Life podcast and we've expanded the business. It was a crazy, you know, last 15 years of my life. But before I start, I want to know how many of you guys are firm owners or thinking of opening your firm or working in a firm? We have quite a few firm owners. I feel like it's a mix of everything. A lot of B and also C. Good. Okay. Because again, most of this is tailored to firm owners. So I want to set a scenario of how as a woman in business, how I was able to level up. There was one experience that I had in Maine. I went to Maine for a meeting 
the the meeting was my company name, by the way, before MGS Global Group was MG Schlachter. It's Michelle Garcia Schlachter. That's me. So the meeting was, I was able to get a contract with a coffee shop who had 50 stores and they were about to grow it to 500 stores. So I was able to partner up with the design build team and the design team and part of the build team. So the contractors hired me, MG Schlachter to attend this meeting in Portland, Maine with this major company. They're about to roll out 500 coffee shops. And I was a big part of the team and the entire process. If you look at the meeting scenario, we have 10 men and two women. Me on the MGS team, I, I was part of the design and the three other men. On the right side, the client side, you have the founders, the CEO. They brought their legal team, their marketing team, finance and purchasing team. And the other lady was the admin staff taking notes. So again, this is like a, I'm setting up a stage of how you can level up as a woman if you're in a meeting. So what happened during the meeting? Day one was site visits. So we barely met the clients, 10 of them. They said, okay, for day one, you're going to look at all the sites so you can make an assessment of how you can proceed. So we did that with my team of four. We went to the site meetings. We went to different sites. But then when the meeting started, people started talking on top of each other. I didn't say a word. So the CEO said, we're here because we want to roll it up to 500 stores and blah, blah, blah. And the contractors were talking on top of each other, talking about construction, talking about cost, talking about scheduling. And I'm just sitting there. We all introduced ourselves. Rob, the guy who used to work with me, who's an architect, said, hey, I'm Rob from MG Schlachter. And then I said, I'm Aya from MG Schlachter, but I kept my mouth shut. But the strategy in this meeting is you just listen and listen and listen. Because sometimes people tend to talk too much and just want to prove that they can outsmart each other, especially in meetings like this. So what I did was I just listened and observed and I barely talked. They're talking about waste construction and pricing and procurement. And I'm like, well, I was looking at the founder. The founder, he was uneasy. He looked very stressed that like he was shaking. And I looked at him, I'm, I'm a founder of a cafe too. I left my cafe business. I knew where he was coming from. The CEO was about to take over his small business and roll it out. So at the end of that, like my last 10 minutes of the meeting, no one talked to me because I was just there. And after the meeting was getting wrapped up, people were like, any other questions? So I said, I have a question. So they said, go carry on. I said, I want to ask a question to the founder. What's your origin story? And where do you see your company in the next five years? Because this is his baby. He grew this copy chain from zero to 50 and no one even bothered to ask him. And then the founder said, now we're talking, I was waiting for someone to ask me that question. None of them knew I owed my cafe, but I could relate to him. And so the conversation started. We needed to create a design, but it had to be based on the origin. And th the founder talked, he was so happy that I asked that question. And later on, at the end of the meeting, the CEO of the company said, who are you? Rob, my staff said, she's my boss. That's MG Schlachter, Michelle Garcia Schlachter. They were just so shocked because the questions that I asked Related to the cafe business procurement, I know everything about franchising because somebody wanted to franchise my cafe, but the strategy is really to keep just listen and observe. Even if you're early in your career, I'm sure you've been in a room where people just like to talk and talk and talk. But if you as an employee or somebody who's worked as in, in the drafting or doing CDs, things by heart, wait, 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 listen, 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 and then start to talk at the end because Sometimes you, a lot of people just like to talk a lot. So one of my first strategies is to really acquire knowledge right now. Knowledge is power and knowledge builds your confidence. So for some of you who are new architects or just new in the profession or young, just graduated, now is a good time to actually make mistakes and learn from your bosses because you have an excuse. I got out of grad school with no CAD experience, no work experience. I thought people were going to like me because I went to Columbia, but my project manager was like, oh my God, this girl knows nothing. I didn't know. I was picking up red lines. I didn't know anything about construction. So early in your career, you need to maybe find a mentor who can help you when you go to a job site or a job meeting. If you don't know, ask questions because sometimes it's better to ask and instead of just faking, it, especially when we're in the architecture, when we're in the site, a lot of us don't have time or don't have the opportunity to go visit a site. If you don't know anything about CA work, Ask your boss to take you and explain to you. You'll never learn if you don't ask. 
And that's one thing about women we don't really ask because we're too shy. But I think if you really want to learn, you need to ask for things that you want. Don't be shy about admitting that you don't know. You got to listen and always ask questions. Another way of really leveling up is benchmarking. Like for firm owners here, this is one of the things that I really look at. If I want to level up and if you guys want to level up, you need to start benchmarking. Like you got to look at your competitors or who you want to be as a firm. Pick a firm that you want to become and then look at what they're doing. How can you become like them? What does their website look like? Look at their LinkedIn profile. What kind of content are they creating or where do they hang out? You should actually benchmark and make sure you, again, acquiring knowledge. We all are creatives. We're not taught how to run a business. So if you can learn from people who have paved the way, try to benchmark and, and imitate. I don't know if you're familiar with the power of persuasion. Persuasion is a method where these clients will come to you already, even before meeting you. How do you do that? The reason why I got this gig to doing this kind of rollout was because my website had all of my, my quick service restaurants, McDonald's, Chipotle. I drafted for McDonald's, Chipotle, 7-Eleven. So the reason why they, they hired me even before meeting me was because when they saw my website, I already had those logos on the website. So again, before even meeting the owner, they already persuaded to work with me. So when you're designing your website, try to get testimonials, things like that. Again, I'll share with you the name of the book and the power of persuasion. So you can learn from that book. And then lastly, you find a mentor who can teach you, especially in business or any type of mentor. But if you're early in your career, you should start to find somebody who can train you in the field, how to do, you know, anything you need, especially when you're young, you should try to learn. Second is build relationships and prioritize this. I hate networking. I hate doing all that, but I'm so used to being uncomfortable because when you're growing a business or if you want to really level up, you, you need to really speak your mind and talk to people, but you also have to be authentic as well. You can't really, I don't believe when you're just, you know, trying to put up fronts. Like I think being authentic is really where you attain success. Look at what Oprah said at the bottom. I had no idea that being your authentic self could make me as rich as I've become. If I had, I've done it a lot earlier. But like Joanne always says, be authentic and show up as you are. Like I never talked about MG Schlachter as me. I named it MG Schlachter so it looked like a Jewish man's company. But I was too shy to admit that, you know, I had some insecurities about my race and gender. So that's why I hid behind my brand. But you don't have to be so... You need to build relationships, go to the bake sale, go to the church event, go to the golf outing, even if you don't play golf. As a firm owner or even somebody in an office, you really have to show up so people will recognize you and know you as a human being, as a person, because that's how you get business. Business is made through relationships, right? I, I always say that if, if you want to build a long-term business, you need to build long-term relationships because like building a, a business without a network is like building your house in a sand. So like I always say, creatives were taught how to master their craft, but not taught how to run and grow a business. And we also don't like to sell. A lot of us hate going to networking events or trying to promote ourselves. But I always say this every time I talk, if you have a product or service that can benefit others, it's your moral obligation to serve as many people as, as you can. So if you're at a bake sale and somebody says, I want to do a, a new house or whatever, you can say, hey, I'm an architect. You have to always, building relationships are key because in, in the long run, the people who have built the most relationships become the most successful. But we cannot build relationships when we're too busy drafting and doing design work. So if you really want to level up, you got to really build relationships. If, if you're a firm owner and you want to see how these big guns are playing, do the events and then go meet people, even if it makes you uncomfortable. So I always tell my friends this, that I'm used to being uncomfortable. Then like, you're always out. I'm like, yep, I'm getting used to being uncomfortable. So yeah, these are my networking events that I attend. This is my book course in a party. That's Jonathan Adler in Vegas. And th these are the networking events I go to a lot of the times. I'm the only girl, but I'm used to it by now. Three, this is like my favorite. It's not how, but who. So who are your advocates and who are the key members of your team? How do you make yourself bigger and stronger? Collaboration is key. So this is my favorite topic. A lot of us probably want to get the bigger projects, right? Like right now, a lot of us are probably doing kitchen renovations or like living dining or bathrooms. But 
we obviously want bigger things. We want to compete with the giants. Well, maybe not the giants, but maybe get a huge house as our first project and not just get pigeonholed into designing, redesigning basements. So this is what I suggest for all of you women who want to level it up. When you present yourself to a potential client, don't say I'm a sole practitioner, even though you are. You should say, yeah, my team and I can do this. You should say my team, even though you don't have a team, because you can always build a team. Or you can be like, my team can do this, and then you do the marketing yourself. You always have to present yourself as the team. Also, right now, it's a time to really build your team of subcontractors so you prepare for what is to come. So if you want to get that big job, you need to find maybe some subcontractors, like a lead consultant. Or like when I was working in Queens, I wasn't licensed, so I, would, I have a licensed architect who, who would stamp my work, things like that. So think about the things that you need to build your team but you don't need to hire them necessarily. You just need to talk to them and say, if I get this job, are you willing to do this? Can you do this? Find a virtual assistant who can help you with marketing. Like you don't have to do everything yourselves. To, when you're presenting yourself to a client, you should always say we and not me, especially if you want to get the bigger jobs. Also, one of the things that I always tell firm owners is try to find people who are better than you at other things to help you with your business. In my case, I'm good at drafting and I can train my people that was my job before I was doing CDs and SDs for my architect clients. But if you want to build your team and get better projects and get higher contracts, perhaps you can get somebody like a business manager or somebody who can do your contract negotiations. Maybe it's your husband or maybe it's your girlfriend who's good at sales and who can negotiate contracts for you. It doesn't have to be you, right? Or you can say, my business manager can send you that contract. You can hand off the contract work to your business manager or your consultant. So that way, somebody can help you in the beginning, help you to ask for better rates. That's what I did. I couldn't really increase my rates, so I hired a business manager and, and he asked me, when was the last time you changed your rates? I said, four years ago. So my business manager, who I have, helps me with talking to the clients and says, oh, it's been four years. So you need to find people who can help you build yourself up. I don't know if you've heard of the book, E-Myth Revisited. As architects, we were not taught how to run a business. If you want to really expand your business, you need to leverage what you already know personally, but the things that you don't know, you hand it off to people and you don't really need to hire full-time. Consultants are the best. Like I have a strategy consultant, finance consultant, a process engineering consultant. You, you talk to them maybe an hour a month, just so you make sure you're in the right path. Because again, when you're benchmarking other successful companies, you know what others are doing. So you, again, knowledge is power. You need to benchmark. You have confidence when, when you know that you're doing the right thing. So try to find who can help you build your, yourself, build your company, and so that you can leverage your strength. If your strength is in design, then find your teammates to do a contract negotiations and things like that. This is another story in my high school reunion. I did client twice. This is another story that you all can learn from. Like, I don't like going to high school reunions because I was not popular in high school and it's in the Philippines and they asked me to talk. I mean, I haven't lived there in like 20 years. They asked me to come back and talk about architecture. It was, you know, woman. I went to an all girls Catholic school. And so they asked me to talk. I said, no, I don't want to talk because I didn't really have a, the best experience in high school. But they asked, I said, fine, I'll talk. So I declined twice, but I sat next to a, a high school classmate who was an entrepreneur and she said, hey, Aya, what, do you have a design firm? I said, nope, I don't have a design firm. I do drafting for you know, architects in the U.S. And she said, are you willing to take on a, a, a design job in the Philippines? I said, sure, what is it? I didn't have a team, by the way. I'm not licensed in the Philippines. I said, I'll think about it. Let me know what it is. So she told me it's a big mall in a little town. I said, oh, okay. But again, I didn't have anyone. I'm not a licensed architect. So what did I do? I found the key team members that can work with me. So when I, I already had a drafting team in the Philippines, I needed to find a licensed architect, a project manager there because I live in the U.S. as well. So I went to the client and I said, okay, let me do that. But at the same time, my biggest frustration and my biggest insecurity is I never got my license because you saw my timeline moving to different countries and like being homeless for two years. But that was my biggest insecurity. And I'm like, maybe this is my opportunity to finally get my design jobs. I've been drafting for hotels and for retail companies for 10 years. I went to Colombia. I've done all this work. I went to all this schooling. I'm not an architect. So I showed up to the reunion. I got a big project. It was a 
80,000 square foot lifestyle mall. I mean, this is a four year project. And then it, I, I live in Cleveland. So there's a design awards and I'm like, you know what? I'll try to add my building and the design awards. I was literally one minute to closing. I didn't know if I was going to make it. So I put my entry in the Cleveland design awards and I won, like our team won, but I'm not an architect. I'm a drafter. Nobody knows who I am, and, but I was still shocked. So after all these years, I'm still shocked that we won by the People's Choice Award. So again, you guys can do it. Just show up, go to your high school reunion, go to the bake sale, build your team. Don't say no, build your knowledge. I still do architecture support. This is just for me to say, I actually can do it. So that's my story about build your knowledge, build your team, network, even though you don't want to, you'll never know what's going to come out of of that high school reunion that you're invited to or that church event or whatever. So show up. The last but not the least is structure and process. As a company owner, when I hire people, especially managers, I always check out the way they organize their resumes and how, when I interview them, I'll ask them, what are your project management skills? How are you, how do you manage a team? Do you have any structure organization? I ask them for their spreadsheets, how they do quotations because that's how, if I want to hire the right people, I want to make sure they're organized and they're well-structured. So if you're an employee and you want to look at going to another bigger firm as a project manager, you need to learn about project management, learn different types of software that can help you get the jobs. Because again, we're not taught this in architecture school. We're not taught process. We're not taught procedure. We're not taught um, anything about onboarding or training process or systems and technology, things like that. One of the things that I've done recently is I hired a Lean Sigma consultant to help me with all my processes because if you want to grow your, your business and your team, you need to have a process for everything and documented processes so you can level up your, your business. And this will also give your firm credibility when you talk to your clients. Yeah, we have an onboarding process. I mean, people don't do that, right? Like regular small architecture firms don't have onboarding processes, but if you're a small firm, or a sole practitioner. And if you tell your client, yes, we have an onboarding process. This is our system. This is how you do this. These are your steps of, you're already building credibility. It doesn't matter if you're a woman, if you're a man, if you're 50, if you're 20. And I learned this from a friend of mine who used to work in General Motors. I said, hey, I'm going to this big meeting in Maine, the Portland Maine meeting. I'm feeling a little kind of stressed because they're all men and nobody knows me. And he said, Aya, in General Motors, if you have the right processes and systems, they won't even look at your gender, race, or ethnicity. It's all about process and procedure for big companies. Right now, think about how you can structure your team or even the way you email clients. You need to create, again, benchmark, follow how these big clients, companies are doing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just learn from them and build yourself up that way. So one of the reasons why I got all these retail clients, even before they met me, I already got the job because they will ask me what my process is. I have a manager who will just send our process. And this is what my process looks like. Before I onboard my clients, again, I'm in the drafting business. So architects want to know what my process is. This is my workflow. So again, it's quite detailed here inside. But when you're running your own project, you might want to talk to your clients and say, this is how it works, stage one. And this is how I do it. I tell them that every stage, there's a client approval. And their milestones and their key team members that will be working with you. For stage one, this is our client onboarding. We identify scope. People like these things, especially the big companies. That's how I'm able to work with Michael Kors and huge companies. Even, even when I had a team of three or four people, I'm not a big company, but I can get big clients because of this. So you can just show them, do you have a process? Yep. That time when I was working with them, I only had three employees, right? But if you show them that you have a process, it doesn't matter if you're a girl or how old you are, you show them your process and, oh, these people are legit, right? So there's a step in every way. There's a client approval who's even at the stage four, you have the project delivery, project closure and archiving. You don't have to have a big team, but make sure when you meet your client, show them this or even communication protocol. I'm sure all of us have worked with husband and wife uh, clients, right? Husband and wife come to you and say, hey, we want to design a house. Sometimes they argue because the husband wants this, the wife does that, and you're the shrink. You're in between them. I have a process for that too. What I'm going to do is when I talk to the client, I'll say, okay, this is my process. One should be the decision maker and one should be the one who pays the bills. 
because sometimes you're caught in the middle and you don't know what to do and it's so stressful. The husband is texting you, the wife wants a, a bathtub, the husband doesn't want a tub. Can you relate, right? So create that, okay, in this project, this is our process. I only want to talk to one person, even in my team or in any team. I also, I don't want my clients talking to certain people. They need to just, we have a communications protocol process. So again, it will avoid confusion. But that's one of the ways you can really level up your firm or yourself, or even as an employee. If your boss or your new company that you're working with, they don't have a proper process, create one and just share it with your boss. Because you'll never know they appreciate. One of the things I like about some of my employees is that they take ownership of the company because they really care about the company, which is why I love my job. I still wish I was a licensed architect, but I don't know, maybe I'll take my license in a few years. I'm already 46. I'm still insecure about that, but whatever, right? <laughs> to summarize, strategy one is to acquire knowledge. Try to learn as much as you can. You need to really, really learn. I was talking to Vivian Lee in my podcast. I, I'm sure you know her. I said, do you feel insecure when you were starting out in your career or did you ever feel discriminated against? And she said, I never had that feeling because I always came prepared. She knew everything. So she had that confidence that she knew everything about the drafting process, the delivery. She did all the work. So if you're prepared, and then you have confidence. Build relationships, even if you're an introvert. I think I'm an introvert. It's not how, but who. We're not taught how to run a business. So we find people, mentors, friends, family to help us and create structures and processes for your firm. And also one of the things that's super important is mindset is everything. My dad and my grandfather always said this, believe that you will receive, there is room at the top. But again, if you don't believe, if you can't visualize yourself that you can achieve it, then you will never achieve it. So you need to take control. You need to take ownership of your success and then believe that you will receive. So here I am today. Now we have a team of over 30 employees. They're all my drafting team is in the Philippines. We're fully remote, but we have training sessions and we train our staff for drafting and all that for a month before they're sent home or they can come to work if they want. A lot of them don't want to come to the office. But yeah, that's my team right now. And then I always want to end my talks with some of the books that I'm reading right now and my favorite books. Indra was a former PepsiCo CEO. She became CEO um, of PepsiCo and she's like, I can relate to her because she was from India. She moved here for school. And I mean, she's real. It's such an inspiring book. Built Boldly by Bolan Lee. I'm sure some of you know her. She works in Mancini Duffy. This is such a great book. It's a short read, but it's so inspiring. Business books, persuasion. This is what I was telling you about. You want your clients to already hire you before meeting you. This is how I managed to get people to work with me without meeting me. So get this book. And the other one is negotiating with giants. It will teach you strategies and how to build yourself, build your firm, and how to negotiate bigger contracts. So let's level up, ladies. But before we end, people wanted to get my workflow. They wanted to see the process workflow so you can download it. It's MGS Global Group forward slash workflow. I also have another one for the checklist if you want to accelerate your business. A lot of strategies here. It's more like a workbook. But Joanne has this too, the website. And then do and listen to my podcast, Architect My Life. I also have a Facebook group called Architect My Life. It's for women firm owners or people who want to start their firms. Thank you. Thanks, Aya. That was great. And I was on Aya's podcast, so go listen to that. <laughs> I just want to say all her links and download are on her page in the event platform. So you can get, go there to download those. Any questions? I love questions. Sorry, my cup was so long. <laughs> If you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. Oh, hi, Rachel, you're here. What does your business manager do and your strategies? Business manager really helped me identify the groups I need to be at. Like if you want to be in the retail space, you have to look at the retail events in the area and go to those networking events. So my business manager helps me identify where I need to go and if it's worthwhile financially. And also the marketing strategies will say, you need to create more content. You need to talk at this events. You need to blog about this. You need to hang out in these spaces. It's not expensive to get a business manager. You'll be surprised. You can consult every once a month or get a business coach. They charge you 120 to 200 an hour, whatever. But that 220 an hour or 250 an hour, that they will give you so much insights. They'll give you homework too. So it's kind of like getting a master's degree for 220 an hour. Right. So I think you got to invest in a business coach or somebody 
who can help you, you know, really take your business to the next level. How do you find the right people? Oh my God. I am so crazy about HR. My drafting team, I have to look through 200 resumes, interview 12 to get three people. I really find the best for my drafting team, but to hire my managers, most of them are like word of mouth or I work in a co-working space in Cleveland and being in a co-working space is really cool because everyone are entrepreneurs. So you, they could introduce you like my bookkeepers from the co-working space, my business strategist I met there, my, my tech consultant. So if you don't have an office and you want, just go to a co-working space. You'll never know who you'll meet. How did you wrap your head around legal requirements starting a business? <laughs> my business is very basic because I'm only in the drafting business. So I just have insurance. So in a way, I have no liability, but I think I actually do have a legal consultant. She's a Filipina from Atlanta. She works in FedEx, but she wants, you know, extra cash on the side. So I ask her about things. So find some friends who would need extra cash and you can talk to. Like most of the people I work with are women who need extra work or who want to work on their side gig. Where did you get your great attitude from? <laughs> I'm Filipina. Or default happy. Like we always smile. So how did you manage your long hours? <laughs> oh my God. I burnt out and I've burnt out so many times that I learned to really hire the right people. I, I gave a talk two weeks ago about work-life boundaries. I was going to talk about work-life balance, but I decided to talk about work-life boundaries because right now there are no more boundaries. Everyone's texting everyone at 2 a.m. At 5 a.m. You're supposed to respond on a Saturday evening at dinner. No, right? So boundaries. So the thing is, this is what I tell people about breathing out and stuff. First of all, we're not doctors. So if we can't deliver our deadline, no one's going to die, Okay. So tell your boss or your clients that can I ask for extension? It's my son's birthday or I need to take my daughter to the dentist or whatever. Like no one's going to die if you miss a deadline, but obviously you got to tell your boss. Second, if you have a problem, people are stressed out about money. They want to make money. They want to meet their deadlines. But if your mental health has suffered, it's not good. It's not fair to your family, to your husband, to your kids that you're not spending time with them, right? So I always say this, if your problem can be solved by money, it's not a problem. Right. But if your problem is your health, then that's a problem. Because as a Filipina, like I almost shut down my business during COVID. And I'm like, you know what? I'll work in Tiffany and make sales commission. I'm a makeup artist. I can charge 150 an hour, which I did. I had a few makeup gigs and I can work in retail in William Sonoma and be okay and have good mental health. My babysitter <laughs> drives a BMW. She works in Verizon. I'm like, man, that's cool, you know? So if your problem can be solved by money, it's not a problem. So take care of your mental health. Are you laughing, Joanne? I just love the way you talk. I don't know. So, yeah, you're, you're, always like, so you're always so happy. I love it. Not really. No, I no, love but it. seriously, like in terms of you never want to jeopardize your health and put things in perspective. I mean, I've experienced my kids like, not seeing me for days. And I missed out on a lot of things. Like that's real. And I feel bad about it. But now that the business has grown, like if you're already so busy, maybe it's time to hire someone, right? Hire a drafter or hire, you know, another designer. That means you have enough money so you can, you know, step back and regain some of your mental health and time with your family and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. I also want to say that I, uh, when I first started the Women Artists Festival, like planning it, and I was telling her I'm starting this conference. And before I even think of a sponsor, she was like, are you doing sponsorship? Because I'm sponsoring your conference. And so thank you for that. You've made me have the confidence to go find other sponsors. <laughs> yeah. But and thank I you so much for being here on a Saturday. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of Architect My Life, a podcast brought to you by MGS Global Group. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to add to the conversation through your own experiences, I encourage you to be a guest in one of our upcoming episodes. Visit architectmylife.com to apply and learn how. I firmly believe that a strong community drives change and fosters success. If you'd like to be part of this community, Join the All Women Architect My Life Facebook group. 
please take a moment to review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks again for listening. I'm Aya Schlachter. Until next time, 